Not yet. Uh, here we go. Well, good morning, everybody, and happy Monday. I'm glad that uh, you could spend about an hour with us to talk about a topic. I call it a hot topic because the ruling just came out a couple of weeks ago. If you watch the news, it was like a quick blurb about uh, the Federal Trade Commission and, and their ruling. Uh, but it's a pleasure to, again, introduce Scott Kasher, who's chair of operations at White & Williams. He's also co-chair of labor and employment practice, worked at the Manhattan DA's office, Temple grad. And uh, he's joined by Chris Terlingo, associate at uh, Archer uh, Business Litigation, uh, also uh, a Rutgers grad. Uh, so Chris and Scott, and we're going to keep this very open and informal like we normally do. Um, I know the three of us had a call last week, kind of just put together some thoughts on how we want to run this program. I'll kind of tee it up, and then I'm going to ask Scott and, and Chris to kind of give their legal take on it. But this is something that's not new to us. I know last year, CINJ wrote a letter uh, opposing the, the ban from the Federal Trade Commission, because this is an outright ban on non-compete agreements, and it affects everybody, and is uh, also retroactive, too. So don't think that if you have something already in place that this net doesn't capture you. It actually does. Um, and you guys have been aware that in the state, uh, there is state legislation that's stalled, but this has been going on for about three years now where um, the state is underway to try to eliminate these restrictive covenants. So, you know, again, I'll, I'll open it up to Scott and, and Chris. Uh, Scott, I, maybe you want to go first and just kind of give everybody an idea of, you know, what this means to them, uh, what happened two weeks ago, give some background, and then, Chris, you could jump in and we'll take it from there. And again, if anybody has any questions, again, we're a small enough group. We're going to want to try to end this before 10 o'clock. I know Scott's got to go to court. And then we can, uh, again, this is being recorded, uh, and it'll be sent out to the membership as a whole. So good morning, Scott, Chris, and everybody. Scott? Hey, good morning, Tony. Thanks. Thanks very much. And good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. So Chris and I actually talked over the weekend, put together sort of an outline of how we're going to present. So I'm going to let Chris go first. He's going to give some background um, on how we got to where we are. I'm going to talk about uh, the rules, exceptions to the rules. And then we're both going to talk toward the end about sort of what comes next. Some pending litigation challenging the rule um, has already been filed. And then, you know, what what all of you can do, what businesses can do, you know, in the meantime. So I'll hand it to Chris uh, to kick it off. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. Uh, and good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time with you all this morning, although I understand uh, our firm, Archer and Griner, has a long history with this organization. Uh, so it's a real pleasure for me to be here and continue that tradition this morning. Um, and thank you to Tony and the team for setting this up. We appreciate it. Obviously, a hot button issue, as Tony said, um, a final rule banning non-competes from the Federal Trade Commission. It's a big development, and there's a ton to unpack with that, much more than Scott and I can do, uh, possibly with the time we have this morning, but we're going to try, we're going to endeavor to try to hit all the big points. And uh, what, what I'm going to do, as Scott mentioned, is kind of hit some of the background. To those who maybe haven't been following it super granularly over the last few years, this seems like a big, dramatic change, right? A ban nationwide of non-compete agreements, and it kind of seems to come out of nowhere. Um, and while it certainly is a big and dramatic change, it absolutely is, it, it didn't exactly come out of nowhere. Uh, this is a process that's been ongoing for the last couple of years, and I'm just, I think it's important to understand that, to understand uh, where and how we got here. Um, so really, the, this story begins uh, over 100 years ago, 1914, the FTC Act, Congress passes that, which among other things, declares it unlawful uh, and prohibits, quote unquote, unfair methods of competition. And that's really the important phrase here with respect to non-competes and what this rule seeks to do. Um, and the FTC Act empowered the FTC to promulgate rules and to uh, pursue enforcement actions against what it, what it perceives to be unfair methods of competition. Now, for 100 plus years after that, nothing happens with respect to the FTC and non-compete agreements. Absolutely nothing happens. What does happen over that 100-year period after 1914 is a body of laws developing about non-compete agreements at the state level. It truly becomes a creature of state law. Uh, some state legislatures are passing laws to either restrict or expand the ability to use these non-compete agreements. 
and state courts are creating a body of common law interpreting that um, either interpreting state statutes or where state statutes don't exist. That is all the law that exists in some of these states uh, to control it. So where does the federal government start to get involved in this space? From my take on the history, it really started in 2014. Um, that's when the Jimmy John's case gets a lot of attention in the news. Jimmy John's sandwich shop was using non-compete agreements for some of their sandwich making employees, preventing them from working at a similar sandwich you know, shop. Uh, and this really catches on like wildfire in the news. It catches the attention of some politicians. Um, and slowly but surely like Domino's, other businesses using these agreements with low wage workers seasonal employees starts to come out in the news. And this is when uh, kind of the drumbeat really begins to get going. In 2016, the Obama administration, the Obama Biden administration issues a call to action, which didn't instruct for a federal ban or really any federal action. But what it did was suggest that the states uh, start to take a look at this issue. And it proposed some state action uh, to kind of start to restrict their use, including, you know, they recommended banning it for certain categories of workers. Uh, particularly low wage, again, building off of the Jimmy John's theme, uh, some increased transparency about them, and to incentivize compliance with uh, monetary fines for employers who don't kind of do these things and continue to use them with low wage workers. But again, it was a, it, it was a recommendation to the states. It was not a, you know, the federal government needs to get involved in this space now kind of thing. In 2020, uh, that Biden uh, starts to pledge to, to step this up and get the federal government involved. Um, and then after being elected, uh, this really starts to pick up in 2021 on July 9th, when two important things happen. The Biden administration issues an executive order that it called promoting competition in the American economy, which for the first time in black and white, encouraged the FTC to pass a, a, a ban, um, banning non-competes using its rulemaking authority uh, under Section 5 of the FTC Act. And that same day, the FTC takes its first step toward that by withdrawing its uh, statement of enforcement principles with respect to Section 5 of the FTC Act. And really what that was was a policy document that said, uh, in the FTC's own words, how it viewed its authority in this space, which from 2015, it said, really, uh, we don't think that we have rulemaking authority under Section 5. We're limited to the antitrust laws and rulemaking in that sphere. Um, they withdraw that. In November of 2022, they put forth a new one that says, actually, we do have this authority uh, to issue rules to curtail unfair methods of competition. And basically, they, they kind of put the blueprint out there that that's what they're going to do. Fast forward to January of 23, uh, two fateful days in January of 2023. January 4th, the FTC issues three settlements with large employers. And what is, as far as anyone could tell, the first rulemaking action. So the FTC actually challenging in court employers who had used non-competes. Uh, they obtained settlements and they put out a press release on January 4th issuing that. The next day comes the proposed rule that we were talking about earlier this morning that uh, everybody's been aware of and now has been a final rule passed. Uh, the settlements announced the day before have been kind of widely criticized as essentially a stage prop that the FTC kind of used to, to demonstrate a history of activity in this space. Um, that's, you know, the allegation anyway. The proposed rule comes on January 5th. Uh, and obviously the basis for that is the FTC's determination that non-compete agreements are a quote unquote unfair method of competition. It has, you know, its own research and studies to back that up. Generally, the claim is that one in five American workers, we're talking about 30 million workers are subject to these, uh, agreements. And the idea is that by frustrating employees ability to move and change jobs that it stifles innovation. Uh, stagnates wages and stuff like that. And that's that's essentially the policy basis and the legal basis for doing this. The proposed ban did a lot of things, some of which made it into the final version. Scott's going to talk about some of it didn't. Um, the big thing that you know, two big things that everybody was concerned about, there was, you know, we're concerned about a lot of things with the proposed rule, but two big things um, that are important and relate to the final version that got passed. One is the idea of a quote unquote de facto non-compete which was the idea that the ban bans non-compete agreements. It doesn't ban non-solicitation, non-disclosure agreements on its face. But what the proposed rule says is if that provision, the non-compete, um, or if one of those provisions, excuse me, the NDA, the NSA type provisions, if they're so broad as to you know, 
be considered a de facto non-compete. The employee under that provision as worded can't effectively work in their industry. It's going to be a de facto non-compete that gets struck down. Um, you know, the concern there is that's a lot of interpretation. That's a lot of subjectivity. Um, how on earth is that going to be enforced? And that was, you know, a lot of comments submitted in opposition to the rule highlighting that. The other one, very quickly, a sale of business exception, um, which a version of that did get into the final rule. But the proposed rule had this unusual caveat that said for it to apply and to be able to use a non-compete in the sale of business context, that person you're using the non-compete against from the selling entity um, had to have at least a 25% ownership interest in the business acquired. And again, they didn't really have a lot of research to back up that arbitrary figure. And then the idea was, well, okay, so if they have a 20% interest, they could still turn around and compete with you the next day after they sell you the business. Doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Um, that 20%, 25% figure, excuse me, did not get put into the final rule. Obviously, the, uh, the proposed rule generated a ton of buzz, over 26,000 comments, a historic number of comments um, about the rule. The FTC's final rule claims that about 25,000 of them were in support of the rule, uh, which is uh, highly dubious in my view. <laughs> um, and uh, in March and May, the, you know, the, the FTC is not the only federal agency in this sphere. And I'm not going to get into this too much. It's a bit of a detour, but the National Labor Relations Board has also sort of weighed in on this. And you right. should be aware of that with the general counsel issuing a memorandum in May of 2023, basically opining that non-competes interfere with employees' rights under Section 7 in the National Labor Relations Act, which, uh, you know, deals with rights to self-organize, to join and uh, assist unions, to collectively bargain. Um, and the idea is that these agreements can frustrate those rights as well. Um, so be aware, regardless of what the FTC does, uh, there are other agencies out there with this in their sights. And then the last other thing I want to say on the roadmap before I let Scott get into why we're all here today, which is the actual rule and what does it say? What does it mean? What are its implications? Um, I, I just want to touch on a few state law developments because state law is important, right? Uh, for 100 plus years after the FTC Act was passed, this always was a creature of state law. And those challenging the rule now say it should remain a, an issue of state law. Um, so obviously what happens in the states if the rule doesn't go into effect is going to continue to control and where agreements, uh, where state law, excuse me, is more restrictive than this ban, which hard to believe, California might be the only one that maybe fits that bill, um, but those will continue to be enforced, uh, enforceable. Um, so at the state law, four states currently ban these almost near entirely, California, Minnesota, North Dakota, Oklahoma. What's interesting about those is, you know, North Dakota, Oklahoma, these show that at the state level, you know, not exclusively a political issue as it's sort of viewed at the federal level. It's actually a little bit more nuanced at the state level. North Dakota, Oklahoma has banned these things since at least the 1800s. Um, so longstanding history there. California ban is of note for just a couple reasons. It's, it's by far the most aggressive ban of non-competes for a few reasons. It had a very uh, detailed and involved notice requirement uh, that had a, this past Valentine's Day was the deadline uh, for those notices to go out to California employees. Uh, but, but the real thing that's garnered all the attention on the California ban is that it, it actually seeks to reach outside of California's borders. It prioritizes its own public policy by saying, regardless of where and when the non-compete was signed, if a California employee ch challenges it in a California court under this California law, California courts are supposed to invalidate it. And, and this has had a few effects, one of which is it's essentially made California a safe haven for workers seeking to avoid enforcement of these non-compete provisions. Our firm's already seen some cases where employees are moving to California and challenging the law there, even though it, it other than the fact that they're now there, it has very, seemed to have very little to do with California. Um, so, you know, that's probably gonna be challenged on some constitutional grounds we don't need to get into now, but even the states, some of them are finding creative ways to ban these agreements. Um, the bandwagon is growing every year. Last year, New York tried to join it state legislature passed a bill that would have banned it. Governor Hochul vetoed it, um, which was good. Save the day for now for employer's perspective, but just keep an eye on it, out on it. She said, you know, not out of the woods yet. She would sign a bill, this being Governor Hochul, if it was a little more narrowly tailored with a sale of business exception and perhaps a wage threshold. So it could still be used for high earners, but not low wage workers. And I'm sure bills like that um, will come and likely end up in law.
uh, New Jersey. Tony mentioned there's been there's been legislation in New, in New Jersey in just about every legislative session on non-competes for years now. Um, nothing's been passed yet, uh, but you should keep an eye on that. But last year's version of the bills would have re, uh, limited them all to one year. It would have required something called garden leave, which is another innovative new development, which if you've never heard of it, garden leave essentially requires an employer to continue to pay an employee their full salary and benefits throughout the period that they're, you know, kept on the bench and can't compete or tending to their garden, uh, which is where the, where the term comes from, uh, among a bunch of other uh, additional requirements in New Jersey. So nothing in law yet. Those bills keep getting proposed. In the absence of a past bill, New Jersey still follows the rule of reason, uh, which any state that, you know, doesn't have an affirmative legislative ban or some other restriction generally applies the rule of reasonableness. That just says these things are enforceable if they protect the, protect the legitimate interest, they contain reasonable scope, duration, geographic requirements, doesn't unduly burden the employee, keyword being unduly burdened, and it doesn't injure the public's interest. As long as those things are checked off, these things are enforceable. That's still a law in New Jersey and in about 46 of the states. Some version of that is essentially the law right now. Pennsylvania uh, proposed a healthcare related bill uh, for non competes that essentially said any dismissed uh, healthcare worker could not be enforced, uh, not could be, couldn't be enforced against them. Bill had a ton of problems, including it didn't define the term dismissed, uh, it didn't pass, but there is some activity over there as well. And uh, just the last one I'll mention Delaware, no legislative law in Delaware, but uh, Scott alluded earlier this morning to, to what I call judicial lack of appetite to enforce these. Um, the Delaware Court of Chancery, you know, Delaware is kind of the incorporation capital of the United States. And so the Delaware Court of Chancery has become a hub of where employers go to enforce non-compete agreements if they're incorporated in Delaware. And traditionally that's been relatively successful as long as the rule of reason is met. Um, but in the last couple of years, the Court of Chancery sort of started to walk away from this. There's instances where they refuse to blue pencil or save what's an overly broad uh, provision. Sometimes courts will just get rid of the bad part and keep the rest of it as long as the rest of it's fine. Delaware's kind of stopped doing that um, in a few high profile cases. They've also refused to honor choice of law provisions um, in some other cases. So uh, from my view, the takeaway in Delaware is state of incorporation alone might not be enough anymore. Uh, if another state with a choice of law provision that picks that state has an interest and has tougher laws on non-competes, you might be at risk there and uh, be wary of relying on the blue pencil doctrine. So if you have an overly broad non-compete, be a little nervous about having Delaware save that provision for you. Um, so the point of all that is just to say, keep an eye on the states. It's evolving quickly and it's gonna continue to be the law of the land if this uh, rule does get enjoined or perhaps struck down as many commentators think it will. And uh, with that, I'm gonna tee it up to Scott to talk about the actual rule and uh, what we need to know about it. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, really helpful background. It, it, you know, really important to understand sort of how we got, you know, to where we are. And also, just listening to Chris's, you know, recitation of the history, it's it's a reminder, at least from my perspective, about why this belongs to the states, why the states should be working these issues out, you know, at a legislative, at a legislative level. Uh, you know, let people come in, let people debate, look at the policies of the particular states and not have a federal agency come in and dictate to every state across the country about what to do. Um, and, and I think that argument is going to carry some weight in these legal challenges. But in the meantime, uh, we're here to talk about the rule. Um, so let's get into it. So the final rule that was uh, just issued uh, prohibits any term or condition in an agreement that, quote, prohibits a worker, and worker is a defined term I'll get to, from penalizes a worker for or functions to present a worker from working after his or her current employment ends. So I'm going to read that again without interruption. The rule prohibits any term or condition in an agreement that prohibits a worker from penalizes a worker for or functions to present a worker from working after his or her current employment ends. So that is, you know, effectively an, an outright uh, ban on, on non-compete. 
non-compete. So I'm going to break down some of the defined terms uh, in, in the rule just to explain it for you. So first of all, the, the word penalizes, which is that in the section penalizes a worker for, in my mind is, is potentially the most broad. Um, and the use of the term penalizes potentially expands the scope of this prohibition beyond literal non-compete clauses to include other uh, common compensation arrangements, for example, which create disincentives to work for a competitor, like compensation clawbacks. The, the term penalizes um, also potentially expands the scope of the prohibition to include post-employment covenants that restrict solicitation of clients. Right. So what Chris was talking about, you know, typical non-solicitation agreements, right? Because you could see an argument made by an employee saying that, okay, my my agreement with my employer is not a non-compete. However, it prevents me from soliciting clients that I work for. Um, so that basically penalizes me um, from leaving this job and taking another job. I mean, it, it's a stretch, but you could see the argument being made, and I can absolutely see some judges accepting that argument as an, a proper interpretation under this rule. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, the rule supersedes all contrary state law. So it basically trumps any state law uh, that conflicts with it. As Chris said, states could always be more strict um, and give the employee more protection, uh, California, some other states, uh, but but states cannot fall below that that federal threshold. Um, garden leave, uh, Chris talked about under the rule, uh, garden leave may or may not be prohibited depending on how it's structured. So the rule defines a non-compete clause as one that prevents the worker from seeking or accepting new employment after the conclusion of the current employment. Therefore, a garden leave provision where the employee remains employed, meaning full compensation, full benefits, but you know, simply not allowed to access, uh, let's say email or the building or things like that, um, that's going to be permissible uh, as the rule is currently written. And that's typically how a garden leave um, agreements are, are structured anyway. Let's talk about the, the term worker. You notice in the rule, they use the term worker, not employee. So the final rule defines worker broadly to include any natural person who works or worked in paid or unpaid position without regard to job title or job classification under state or federal law. Very broad. Um, the term expressly encompasses employees, independent contractors, sole proprietors who provide a service. The term excludes franchisees and franchise or franchisee relationships, but not employees of the franchise or, or franchisee. Um, Chris mentioned the proposed rule that came out in January of last year, 2023, um, and the final rule, I just want to talk about a couple of differences between that proposed rule and, and what was finally uh, included in, in the final rule. So as Chris said, January 2023, the FTC first proposed a rule of banning non-competes. After announcing that, uh, they invited public comments on the proposal. And uh, Chris, I think you said it was over 20,000, right, that they got yeah. comments in? Over 26,000. Yeah, over 26,000, uh, a lot of business groups, associations, uh, lobbyists and the like. But the leading themes included in those comments and objections, really, uh, th there were a, a couple of big ones um, that I noticed. The first was um, the adverse impact that this rule would have on the protection of intellectual property of a business. Um, and the absence of any intellectual property exception to the proposed non-compete rule. Two, uh, the proposed rule, and this is you know the original 2023, the proposed rule's tendency to disincentivize investment in worker training. And three, concerns that nonprofit healthcare providers 
would be unfairly advantaged by the proposed rule since um, they're exempt from it. So based on the differences between the FTC's initial proposal and the final rule, it does seem like the FTC considered a lot of that public comment, the concerns, the complaints made, made about it. Um, for one, the proposed rule required employees to proactively rescind any existing non-competes that fell within the rules reach. They had to actively go out and rescind all those agreements. The final version has no formal rescission requirement and only obligates employers to provide notice that the old non-competes no longer apply. Um, the final rule allows employers to maintain existing non-competes with senior executives, and that's a defined term. Um, still, employers will not be able to enter into new non-competes with senior executives. So it's just a, a grandfather clause for, for existing ones. The final rule sale of business exception, which Chris mentioned, um, differs from the original one uh, formulated because, as Chris said, it no longer includes that 25% ownership threshold. And the FTC <clears throat> explained that it dropped that requirement um, uh, after after receiving a lot of comment uh, and, and reflection. Some exceptions. Um, so there is this exemption exception for existing non-competes with senior executives. Um, again, a change from the proposed rule um, for existing but not new non-competes. Um, it's basically acts like a, a grandfather uh, clause and enables them uh, to remain in effect. Um, an issue to be aware of that, that could arise is if an employer enters into an amendment to existing to an existing employment um, agreement containing a non-compete uh, with a senior executive, uh, perhaps relating to compensation or other terms, you know, what, what potentially is the impact uh, of that? We'd expect that businesses to take the position that such amendments are not new non-competes. Uh, they're just an amendment to the existing one, which is permissible. Uh, and so it should remain valid uh, and enforceable. For all other workers, not senior executives, uh, existing non-competes uh, will become unenforceable when the rule becomes effective. Uh, in a departure from the proposed rule, again, no requirement to rescind, just to notify. Um, and uh, there are some specific notice provisions in the rule, and I think they even give a sample form uh, about how to how to notify uh, delivery by hand, mail, email, text, you know, that sort of thing. So let's talk about uh, the definition of senior executive. Um, the rule defines senior executive as one, uh, a person or persons who were, quote, in a policy-making position, close quote, and two, received annual compensation, that's all in, bonus, salary, everything, of at least $151,164 in the preceding year. Um, so, look, there. I think there are going to be a lot of people that meet that salary threshold, but not a lot of people in the policymaking position. So that's going to be a key distinguishing factor, I think, for a lot of companies to say, right, a lot of people, you know, make that much money, but uh, but they're not really in policymaking positions. And the rule talks about what, what a policymaking position is. So for these individuals, um, ex existing non-compete agreements, again, remain in effect. Um, no new ones. Policymaking position, in quotes, is defined under the rule as, quote, a business entity's president, chief executive officer, or the equivalent, any other officer of a business entity who has policymaking authority or any other natural person who has policymaking authority for the business entity, similar to an officer with policymaking authority. So that's not going to be a lot of people from my perspective, right? You're talking about the top people in the C-suite and not everybody in the C-suite. I mean, there are a lot of vice presidents, lots of vice presidents out there that don't have any policymaking authority, uh, right? They have seniority in the company, 
they make a lot of money, but they're not setting policy for the company. That that tends to be a fairly small uh, group, you know, depending on on the size of the company. Um, the rule does indicate that it's possible for a senior executive to be an officer of an affiliate or subsidiary of a business entity um, that's part of the common enterprise if the employee has policymaking authority for the common enterprise. Again, that policymaking is, is the key provision there. The FTC stated that its goal with these definitions was to prevent overbroad application of the definition to lower level workers. Um, Let's talk about uh, sale of business. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, the final rule exempts non-competes entered into by a person pursuant to a bona fide sale of a business entity of the person's ownership interest in a business entity or of all or substantially all of the business entity's operating assets without regard to such person's percentage ownership interest in said business entity or assets. So again, this is a, a, a change from the proposed rule that Chris mentioned about the 25% ownership. It's consistent with the way common law has been for a long time uh, in the States. You know, as Chris mentioned, judges, uh, it, certainly in my experience in litigating these non-competes over the last 10 or 15 years, judges have no problem enforcing non-competes in connection with sale of a business. They have been skeptical for a long time about non-competes for employees uh, who are really anyone below the C-suite um, and, and not really too inclined to enforce them. They'll, they'll, they'll enforce non-solicits, NDAs, but not outright non-competes, unless you're someone very senior uh, who had privy to a lot of delicate, sensitive information on the company that you could use uh, to compete. Um, talked about uh, the states uh, and their ability to provide more protection uh, if they want. Can I jump in, Scott? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, because we had a question in the chat as far as sure. the deadline to provide notice. I think it's important to tell everybody, right? The rule doesn't really take effect for another 120 days. That's correct. I'm going to get to that in a minute, uh, okay. but that's right. The, the rule, the rule uh, is goes into effect 120 days after it's published. I believe the publication date was set by the FTC for tomorrow. I'm not sure if that's changed. So we're probably looking at, uh, you know, the early September. Um, that is, of course, subject to legal challenges, which Chris is going to talk about toward the end of the program. There are a number of lawsuits that have already been filed uh, challenging this rule. Uh, and I think the expectation is that uh, the courts are going to put a stay on the rule uh, while the issues are litigated because they're complex, but we're going to get to that. So hopefully that's clear, Tony, 120 days from publication. Publication is supposed to be tomorrow. So we're looking at first week in September. It yeah. Will go into a so I guess, uh, and I know, Mark, you had asked a question as far as providing notice to employees. Nobody should be doing anything now, right? Correct. So, it's not okay. correct. It is not in effect. There, there, there's no rule in effect right now. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay, uh, let's um, skip down. We talked about uh, franchisees. Um, now, there are also, this isn't really an exception, but there are certain entities that just are, are exempt from the FTC's jurisdiction under the FTC Act uh, that Chris talked about. Um, and uh, that would include, you know, generally certain financial institutions, banks, credit unions, savings and loans, some nonprofits uh, and air carriers. Um, again, uh, effectiveness of the rule and anticipated timing, absent uh, an effective legal challenge, which Chris is going to talk about, uh, delaying or barring enforcement. Rule goes into effect 120 days following publication. Publication likely will be tomorrow. Companies will have to be in compliance with the rule by the effective date. Um, so uh, you certainly would want to be start getting prepared. If there if there is no stay and and it looks like the rule is going to go into effect on in early September, you know companies need to be you know prepared as of that date. Um, enforcement of the rule could be delayed. Um, it could be barred completely by a legal challenge. Uh, I'm not sure that 
complete bar is going to happen before September, but it could. Uh, my expectation is it's probably going to be a stay, and then the court is going to allow some litigation and discovery to take place and some legal briefing around some very complicated legal issues about states' rights, constitutionality, uh, uh, right to contract, uh, all those sorts of things. Um, interestingly, so there were um, uh, two dissenting commissioners uh, when this rule was issued who expressed concern that the FTC lacked authority uh, under the law to promulgate this rule. And that's going to be one of the arguments in the legal challenges is a lack of authority to even uh, issue the rule. Um, additionally, uh, on April 22nd, uh, the day before the commission's vote, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Commerce vote to immediately challenge the rule, and they did file suit. Chris will talk about that one. I think that was filed in, in Texas. Um, talk for a minute about the status of other restrictive covenants. We, we talked a little bit about them, NDAs, uh, non-solicits. The rule does not categorically prohibit NDAs uh, or non-solicits, but, you know, as, as Chris mentioned, and as I mentioned, they, they could effectively be swallowed up in this rule, depending on how the judge or judges uh, interpret um, the terms in the rule. So they're not, they're not completely safe. Um, talked about notice, violations of the rule. The rule provides that the use and non-competes in violation of the rule is a, quote, unfair method of competition that violates Section 5 of the FTC Act. Um, this means that the rule does not merely render covered employer-employee uh, agreements unenforceable, um, but rather establishes that entering into such agreements or attempting to enforce existing agreements contrary to the rule amounts to an unlawful act itself. Violations of the FTC Act can result in fines, penalties, injunctive relief. Um, I think at this point, we're gonna go to the last section of the program before we open it up to Q&A, sort of next steps. Chris is gonna talk about some of the uh, pending litigation, some of the legal challenges, uh, and then I'm gonna end with some, um, some takeaways. Then we can open it up if people like to to talk about some things. Absolutely, thanks, thanks, Scott. Uh, really appreciate that. Just a couple other things on the rule I want to hit really quickly. Um, a couple other exceptions in the rule um, that are sort of poorly defined, uh, but one is there's a good faith belief exception that um, if there's a good faith belief that a non competes valid under the ban for one or another reason, there is an exception there. Um, could perhaps be some crafty lawyering in the future to use that, but its its scope is relatively unclear at this point. And there's also an exception for existing causes of action. So if you know there's a valid non-compete now that's breached between now and the effective date, the cause of action for breach arose prior to the effective date. So that would also be um, that could be pursued. Um, as far as the exemption for nonprofits, that that's a big one, but just keep that on your radar because there is some mounting legislative attention to perhaps trying to bring nonprofits or at least certain of them within the jurisdiction of the FTC. That hasn't happened yet, but it is, um, there's been bills proposed to that effect, particularly in the healthcare space um, due to the kind of the proliferation, proliferation, excuse me, of not-for-profit hospitals. Um, and lastly, uh, just a point on notice. So the FTC did provide a model notice that it says you can use that would be in compliance with the rule. Uh, I encourage you to actually take a look at that You'll notice it suggests including some statements in there that I think are a bit gratuitous and not actually required under the rule. For instance, it suggests you tell employees that uh, you may work for another employee employer even if it competes with employer name. You may start your own business even if it competes with employer name um, and things like that. But what the rule actually requires is that you tell these employees who have now uh, unenforceable provisions is that the employer will not and legally could not enforce that agreement uh, against the employee now due to the passing of the non-compete ban. So, so just be mindful that the, the actual model notice might go a little farther than it's actually required. Um, and September 4 is the, is the actual effective date as of now, which would be 120 days from tomorrow's date that Scott mentioned. Um, again, that's barring any stay. And lastly, 
Um, there's a severability provision in the final rule. So, you know, lawyers, good lawyers put in contracts that if any provision of this contract is, is uh, wiped out by a court, the rest of the contract will remain in force. The FTC's kind of tried to protect itself by putting something like that in the bill that says if a court wipes out any provision of uh, this final rule, the rest of it's going to remain in force if possible. So they've kind of tried to put a, a safety net, um, fully anticipating that these challenges were going to come. Um, and speaking of challenges, let's let's talk about those really quick. So immediately after the FTC took its vote three to two, uh, uh, proposing or uh, finalizing this rule, a company called Ryan LLC, very large financial services firm, firm filed suit hours after the vote in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Texas. Um, since filing suit, they filed a complaint, an amended complaint. They've also filed a motion for a stay and injunctive relief. So as Scott talked about, they've asked the court to, hey, put this rule on hold while we figure this out. So that motion has been filed. Uh, they filed it and they filed uh, a motion requesting expedited briefing to try to move it along. The FTC's opposition to that motion is due tomorrow. So after the court decides that, we'll have a better idea of when a merits decision on the stay uh, could be anticipated um, until we get a rule on the scheduling order there. We won't know for sure. But a lot of people think probably early June is perhaps when that might um, come down. But again, we'll, we'll find out more this week on that. The day after Ryan filed his suit, the day after the vote, the Chamber of Commerce filed the suit that Scott referenced. Um, that was filed in the Eastern District of Texas, so also in Texas, just in a different district. Uh, as I mentioned to Tony, just before this program started, on only Friday, uh, the court put a stay on the Chamber of Commerce's suit. So. What the FTC did in that case was they said, hey, we're facing two challenges in the District Court of Texas to the same thing. We have to defend in multiple cases. The claims are the same. The effects, the requested relief is the same. Let's put a hold on this second second one filed by the Chamber of Commerce and just deal with the first one. Um, it, it's what's known as the first file doctrine in federal court. Um, and on Friday, the court granted that. So the Chamber of Commerce's suit is frozen for now. It's not dismissed. It's just put on pause while this first filed Ryan suit goes forward. So that's the one you want to watch in the Northern District of Texas. Um, you should also know a third suit was filed on April 25th, just across the river um, in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania uh, by a tree services company. Uh, the brief was filed by the Pacific Legal Foundation, which is a conservative legal advocacy group that's um, well known for challenging agency action kind of in the courts. A lot of people speculate that they filed that suit in the in the Eastern District to try to create a circuit split um, in the event that the Texas litigation goes the challenger's way. Um, the Third Circuit scene is perhaps more friendly to the agency's action. So if the Third Circuit were to go the agency's way, you have Texas going the other way, that's just another route to get to the Supreme Court. Um, so, the, you know, the, the goal is to, to put a stop to put the, the rule on freeze or get it struck down or get it in front of the Supreme Court. These are all the things that are out there trying to be done. Um, wh what are the claims? What, what is the basis for challenge? Scott alluded to some of them uh, before. Federalism, separation of powers, these are some of the big ones. The idea that essentially what this rule does by invalidating all these non-competes is it's essentially legislating. It's essentially an um, executive agency legislating and Congress should be doing that. State legislatures should be doing that. Um, not Congress. That's a doctrine called federalism that is one of the biggest um, challenges in all three of these litigations that are being put forward. Uh, the scope of the FTC's authority that the FTC, okay, even if it does have rulemaking powers writ large, it's gone beyond that here. Um, it's limited to things like antitrust, um, which is, you know, anti-competitive activity industry-wide sp focused on specific industries, monopoly behavior, things like that. Um, or it's also limited to things like deceptive trade practices, which the FTC Act uh, kind of details in more in more uh, detail than it does in the uh, unfair methods of competition space. Um, and then the major questions doctrine is another big one that has been successful for challengers to agency action of late. Um, the major questions doctrine basically says, you know, anything that is a question of major economic or political importance should be decided by Congress and not by federal agencies. Um, the Supreme Court used that in just the last couple of years to strike down some uh, EPA action. So that is a big one that um, 
you know, the interesting thing about the final rule is, is the FTC seems to acknowledge that this is a major question. They acknowledge that, you know, there's 30 million workers subject to these things. They cite a lot of data about increases in wages and stuff to support the rule, all of which kind of suggests that it is a major question of economic uh, importance. So there seems to be some merit to that challenge as well. Um, and then there's just basic evidentiary things like, is there enough data to support the idea that this is anti-competitive? Because there's a lot of research that says actually it's it's not anti-competitive. It allows employers to invest in employee training and things that they no longer will be able to do, or at least to the same extent, if we ban this on a nationwide level. So, you know, the data is kind of less than clear. And, and that's basically the claim there is what we call arbitrary and capricious action by the government, uh, insufficient evidentiary basis for what they've done. So these are the various challenges that are out there that are being brought in these three litigations. There may be more uh, to come, but that that first one, the Ryan case in the Northern District of Texas, I, I think is the main one to watch at the moment. That's probably on the fastest track. And- uh, So, yeah. I was gonna say, uh, I guess I, on behalf of a non-attorney, Scott and, and Chris, you guys explained it just eloquently in, in a way that I understood everything you said. So, um, so thank you for that. Uh, with the few minutes that we have remaining, because I know Scott's got to go to court, does anybody have any questions that you could always unmute yourself, uh, Dennis? And before, just before we get to questions, uh, just a couple other small points, just takeaways, Tony, you know, for people to think about, because um, it's a, it's sort of a confusing time. So again, just want to remind people that, you know, while all this litigation is pending and until the rule goes into effect, there is no prohibition on non-competes, um, right? So it is as if, you know, we're the day before uh, it, it happened. Um, companies can still enter into new non-competes, you know, as long as it's permitted under your, you know, state law, uh, you, you can do that. Um, you might want to start thinking about just as a housekeeping matter, identifying who the quote unquote senior executives are um, assuming that the rule goes into effect. So remember, you have the salary threshold and you have the policy making threshold. You know, look within your company, figure out who those people are. You can enter into those agreements with those folks, right? Remember, you're going to be grandfathered in. Um, so think about, you know, if you don't have them or you want some new ones, uh, think about, you know, who's who's in that um, who's in that bucket. Um, and then, you know, as we said to Tony last week when we were talking, you know, Chris and I are happy uh, to give updates if the group wants, you know, periodically with the litigation. So we'll be in touch with Tony and happy to jump on and, and uh, you know, whether that's in a couple of weeks, once a month, whatever you like. So with that, uh, let's open it up. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And, and by the way, thank you for uh, defining in three words, our government arbitrary and capricious. I'm going to use that. So um, yeah, my question uh, relates to actually us, uh, Delta Dental. We're, we're a 501c4. Um, you know, we are a benefits administrator and insurer. We're not a healthcare provider. Um, yet, as you guys know, under a C4, you can operate for-profit subsidiaries, which we do under the parent organization. So my question is more a validation. We should probably start thinking about based on what we have today, I know subject to change, but what we have today, we will probably be covered uh, under under this or exempted. That's that's my question. Hmm. Well, it's a great question, Dennis. Um, and Scott, I don't know if you have any thoughts that immediately jump out at you. Um, I think, you know, as a nonprofit, right now I would think it's more likely than not that it wouldn't apply to you, but it can't hurt to be prepared and to start thinking about the things that Scott is suggesting, that who are your senior executives, who might be exempt if this thing does apply to us, who are the realm of people in our company that this would apply to in general, senior executives or not, who do we have non-competes agreements with, and start to, to collect all that information in the event you need to do notice, in the event there's work to be done before September 4th, so you have that collected um, and ready to go. Um, and, and really, I think just this is kind of a general point for everybody who needs to be thinking about the best practices in the event that this thing gets passed. For anybody you want to enforce a restrictive covenant against, be it a non-compete 
which um, will be banned if it gets passed, but things like N NSAs, um, NDAs, what for each of these employees you want to enforce this against, what specifically is a protectable interest and what is the most reasonable limited way we can do it with the idea of being avoiding this de facto argument, this creative lawyering of saying, well, this provision functions to prevent me um, from doing that. If you can show a, a reasonable basis for what you've done and why it's necessary to protect your interest, that's going to give you the best chance to avoid that argument. Um, but but the short answer to your question is the, the, the nonprofit space is uh, one of the gray areas of this rule. But in general, nonprofits are not within the FTC's authority um, under the FTC Act. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's not. I agree with with, with Chris. It, it, I, I think that that's generally, uh, you know, a fair reading. But there's not a hundred percent, you know, certainty. So I was just looking for uh, a quote. So the. Um, the agency wrote that, quote, tax exempt status is certainly one factor to be considered, but doesn't overrule further inquiry into the entity's operations and goals, right? So <laughs> I just don't know, uh, you know, that a, uh, that a, that a nonprofit is totally safe, um, but, uh, but uh, just on balance, I think right now uh, it probably is. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Hi. Uh, yes. Um, thank you so much, Chris and Scott. This has been really informative. And by the way, hi, Dennis. It's been a long time. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I had a question. Should we preemptively think about as an organization where we've got folks who've come from other organizations that are probably chomping at the bit to, you know, uh, get this off of, you know, be not not under a non-compete, should we proactively be sending something to our associates to say, listen, this isn't baked yet. So, you know, hold hold tight because I've already gotten some um, some inquiries from former employees about what their NDAs and non-competes state. So I'm assuming that people might um, start jumping the gun, if you will, because they don't understand that this is not in place until September. So what, what would your what would your thoughts be? Should should I be sending a note to my employees to say, hey, you know, let's let's hold hold still until uh, this is passed or or not? Yeah, so my thought, Peter, and, you know, great question is I, I would keep the advice at a high level. Uh, right. I think you want to be letting your senior most people know um, that this rule is not in effect. Uh, pending challenges, uh, company is considering what it's going to do, uh, and that they should relay that you know message out you know to to people below. I don't think you want to be issuing anything in you know writing or, you know alerts that go out to everyone. I. I think probably better to the extent it's workable uh, to have those conversations uh, led by senior leaders with particular groups. Um, because look, I, I, my gut is telling me that um, that the FTC really went too far here and and the courts are going to have some some problems with this. So could be wrong. Um, it's happened before. Uh, I don't like when it happens, but sometimes I'm wrong. Um, but but I, I just think this is this is such a reach here that that I think a court is going to say uh, it's too much. You went beyond your authority. Uh, maybe draw up something you know more narrow. Let Congress act. So anyway, the short answer is that would be my advice. Chris might have a different view. Thank you. Yeah. No. I, I and great question, Peter. As he said, and I, I agree with Scott said. I, I don't know that there's a need or that it's advisable to be proactively going out there at this point to people. And to the extent you, you feel it is, I would recommend keeping it to a high level, as Scott said, just because of how quickly this is evolving um, with changes and challenges being brought every day. I think to the extent you're asked, the message can be, look, nothing's changed. Um, this is not effect the law. The law has not changed on non-competes. The law has not changed on your agreement at this time. We're monitoring developments. Um, at the federal level with new changes in the law. But as of now, it's business as usual um, until September. And, and like Scott said, I'm I'm relatively confident as as much as anybody can be at this point um, that, you know, the courts are going to scrutinize this. And, and the question is just to what degree and when.
Um, and that's the message is business as usual. We are following these developments. I think. So Great. I've got to jump off. I've got a 10 o'clock court appearance. Just want to say thank you to Tony, Chris, you, uh, everyone on the team there. And to all of you for attending today. And again, happy to circle back, Tony, with you. If you have members that want some follow up yeah. on the litigation, Chris. And thank I you, Scott. Have. All right. Thank you, luck in court. Thank, uh, thanks, everybody. I know thanks, we're, thank you, Scott. We're approaching the hour here. Any last questions for Chris? Hi, my name is Annette. I actually have one quick question. Um, based on some re research that I did on SHRM, um, I did find some language that said that this rule applies in some cases to agreements that may require employees to pay back the employer for any training costs. I don't know how that would be embedded. We certainly don't have that in our non-competes, but are you familiar with any of this language? The language being that the the ban could apply to agreements requiring employees to pay back pay training back. costs? Correct. If the employment terminates um, within a certain period of time, I guess. I guess what it would. I, I'm not familiar specifically with if anywhere in the 570 pages of the rule it specifically addresses that particular situation. But what I can tell you is it's going to be a matter of interpretation that comes down to whether that payment um, can constitute either a, a penalizing the worker for doing something or if it's functioning to prevent the worker from seeking or accepting new employment. Now, Understood. now one, one would think you'd be hard pressed to say that's a penalty, right? Because it's, it's essentially recompensation for something they got training, right? But a craft dealer could try to say, well, you know, for whatever reason, they're unable to make that payment back to them. So does that mean I'm stuck? I Because I can't make this payment back, I can't get a new job or I can't start my own business or something like that. It's going to go down. To, can those arguments be made? And based on the situation you're presenting, it, it sounds like it could be a stretch, but there's, you know, lawyers out there who their whole job is to, to make those kind of arguments. Right, right. So, right. You know, I, I never want to say that a lawyer can't find an argument out there somewhere because that's what we get paid to do. But um, <laughs> I think <laughs> Thank like, you. Well, sort of a gray area, sort of a matter of interpretation. And just one programming thing that I think everybody should be aware of, the FTC just last week announced they're hosting what they're calling a compliance webinar. On Tuesday, May 14th, that's a week from tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time. It's going to be by Zoom where they're going to explain the rule in their own words. Um, and so if you want to get some of this straight from the horse's mouth, I suggest trying to get on that if you have the time. I know I'll be logging on as well to see what they have to say. Yeah, Chris, that, great, great point. Uh, and thank you, everybody. Uh, it's 10 o'clock. Uh, Chris, this was great. I know I learned a lot. And I want to thank Scott and thank everybody for being on. I'm sure we're going to have a follow-up event because uh, everything is happening so fast here. So uh, enjoy the week, everybody. Hope to see you at the next event, and uh, we'll see everybody soon. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Tony.